Okay, so we'll start with refuge in Bodhicitta. Sange churam soge churam hai janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi jun yangi pe sonam ki rola benjir sange dupa sho sange churam soge churam hai janchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi jun yangi pe sonam ki Rola penchi sange drupa sho sange churam sogi churam na chanchu padu dani kapsuchi dagi chen yangi pe sonam gi rola penchi sange drupa sho. So just letting that motivation sink in, reviving and clarifying. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me, so this session, we're going to mainly be talking about the mantra. Okay, and there's a few mantras and mantras in general, but we'll also have time to discuss some other things. Um, the symbolism of Tara herself will continue talking about probably tomorrow. So we'll kind of like put a pin in those and come back to them. But today is, uh, or this session is going to be the mantra. So before we jump into it, did you have hanging questions that uh, bubbled up from the lunch break that you wanted to ask? Yes, Christina. Um, you know how you were saying that um, your root guru is the uh, teacher that you take, I should speak louder, that you take um, uh, empowerments from? The question I have is, uh, let's say you have a precious opportunity to take an empowerment and mm. you know that this teacher maybe is associated with your root guru or is in the same lineage and, and so therefore although you haven't had any connection with them or whatnot is it okay to take empowerments mm. uh, from these teachers because what i realized is that i've taken empowerments from some teachers in the past and i didn't even realize that now they're they're part of my you know lineage and my root guru yeah and people would say oh you know who's your root guru or whatever and i'd be like this person is my root guru and they're like oh so all your empowerments are from them and i'm like oh no i have some power from this person <laughs> yeah. and i have you know, yeah. and then, um, so I, that was my question. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. That's a, that's a common one. Um, did you guys on Zoom hear Christina okay? Yeah, so, you know, this idea that um, you only need, that, that you can only have one root guru, first of all, you can have more than one root guru, so no problem there. Um, you can you can take empowerments, the same empowerment from many different llamas. I, I have a white Tara empowerment from at least four or five different llamas. But the one I'm thinking of when I do the practice is my go-to root llama for everything. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't have to be the case. You can do the many into one vibe where all of your teachers are embodied in white Tara, all of them. Mm -hmm. Or you could think your main ones, mm -hmm. or you could think just one. So that's one piece. The other piece is who do you take an empowerment from? Do they have to be someone that you feel that root guru feeling with, or could they just be in the same lineage or a teacher of your teacher, for example? And it would seem, it would seem rational to just take an empowerment of the teacher of your teacher. That seems like it would be a good plan. You always wanna check. Yeah, you want to check with your teacher if you can. You might not have a, a chance to check with them. They might be too busy, have too many students, whatever. But um, I guess don't assume that just because they're in the lineage that they're the right one for you. Mm. You always have to do your own checking. Now, if in the past you were just like, I'm assuming they're fine. My teacher thinks they're fine. They're fine. It's not the end of the world is fine. <laughs> and we all probably have done it at some point in our Dharma path. Very normal, very common thing to do. Um, sometimes even promoted at Dharma centers, like don't even worry about who they are. They're a teacher of your teacher. Don't even worry. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, Tantra is so precious and death is so certain. It seems like you might as well. But, <laughs> but there are some dodgy teachers with big names. <laughs> 
you got to have your eyes wide open. And sometimes their dodginess was not apparent immediately at the time that their relationship was cultivated with your teacher. And so your teacher needs to hold them in high regard because they've already made that connection. But actually their appearances might be something that disturbs your mind. If you see an appearance of a breach of ethics, if you see, I don't know, financial embezzling, if you see a huge temper, if you see big extreme things that go against the Dharma, will you still be able to relate to them in this tantric way on your cushion or will it really rattle your mind? And everybody is charismatic their first hour with them, right? Like anyone on the throne is gonna be lovely and well-spoken and say good Dharma things the first hour. So, you know, the advice, of course, in the Lam Rim is wait 12 years <laughs> before taking your teacher. Wow. Um, I say, please wait more than 12 hours. <laughs> please, from my heart, wait more than 12 hours. Um, and I mean 12 hours with them, not 12, you know, not just like sleep on it. 12 hours with them in general Dharma teachings to really watch and observe, do they seem to practice what they preach? Um, you do your Googling, right? And you do your deep dive into the internet and see, are there rumors about them that I want to follow up on? Because if I come across them later, it's gonna be much more problematic if I already have that karmic connection. So you do your deep dive and just because someone has rumors doesn't mean they're, they're true. Of course, we wanna give people the benefit of the doubt, but we're grownups. We know often where there's smoke, there's fire. So you do your researching and, you know, if something you read is troubling your mind, ask. Yeah, it's not disrespectful to just ask about it, follow up. Um, so, you know, I guess the answer is yes and no. Like, yes, of course, take empowerments from the teachers of your teachers, generally speaking, but really there is no way around personal responsibility with that relationship mm -hmm. you always want to be checking for yourself because even they might be perfect with pure ethics totally fine but you just don't relate to them you know and there's just like you're having trouble synchronizing and then you feel you know kind of this funniness so make it personal make it real I guess Tantra is so incredibly rare. You wanna make sure that you're preparing your mind to receive an empowerment whenever you come across them. They're rarer and rarer to find. Even the last five, 10 years, they're much harder to come across than they were even 10 years ago. Feels like even 10 years ago, you could just, any Dharma center, tons of qualified lamas, you know, get lots of empowerments. Now it's slowing down. It's the degenerate age. It'll be harder to find, but also, the dodginess of teachers is more and more exposed, um, which is good, right? We don't want to fall into the same mistakes of other religions. Like, you know, with greatest respect, the Catholic Church, that's not gone well, the secrecy, right? We don't want to do that. Um, so just keep your common sense that knows people in positions of power often abuse their power. That's true in every single walk of life, in every single religious tradition, in every single profession. Have your common sense and your eyes wide open and check. Rinpoche does not equal enlightened. Rinpoche equals theoretically a recognized reincarnate Lama or someone who was the abbot of a great monastery and was given that label due to work in this life or they bought it, right? So like a little healthy skepticism yeah, there's, you know, Tibet and India and Nepal are political like everywhere else. And there are ways in which, you know, wealthy families with a lot of political clout might navigate and negotiate things in such a way that their child is the one that is found. So eyes wide open. Okay, team. <laughs> eyes wide open. Yeah. So I, you know, I say that and it, it might kind of make you a little bit, I don't know, disillusioned or disheartened, but don't let it be. There are a million great teachers out there. It's just, we can't have, I guess, spiritual laziness that just thinks, I'm sure they know what they're doing. I'm gonna put all my karmic cards in their basket for the, until the end of time, even though I've only just met them the once. Yeah. <laughs> you know, don't do that. Yeah, do your own checking. And if you have a funny feeling, follow up on it. Yeah. Yeah, any thoughts Thoughts about that? It's an important thing to guru. I have a question. So um, 
you have any story about your great teachers? Like, have you, have, have you been interacting a lot with Lama Zobar, for example? And what are the things that inspires your confidence in him or her? Um, do I know Lama Zobar Rinpoche and why do I like him? Is that the question? About, um, do you have any stories about your favorite teachers? Um, oh. What confidence in him or her. And I mentioned Lama so far because I assume that he's one of your teachers since you are in distribution. Yeah, yeah. So I'll repeat the question for the Gompa people. And um, uh, you were asking, do I have any stories about my own teachers and what inspired me to connect with them? Um, and so Yes, of course. And of course, I do love Lama Zopa Rinpoche is one of my teachers, of course. Um, I mean, I say, of course, because I'm in an FPMT center. So if he wasn't one of my teachers, that would be weird. <laughs> right. But it's not to say that you can't come here and not have him as your teacher. You're very welcome. It's just I teach here. So that would be weird. <laughs> yeah. So we welcome um, Buddhists who are of any tradition. We also welcome non-Buddhists, so know that everybody's welcome. You don't have to be a Buddhist to practice Buddhism. Side note, you do need to be a Buddhist to practice Tantra. You do need to be a Buddhist to practice Tantra, but all other forms of Buddhism, you don't need to be Buddhist to practice. Important note. Okay, so the, my story with Lama Zopa Rinpoche is that I heard that he was an amazing being with an amazing series of lives preceding him. I knew that he was the founder of this organization and I had read some of his books and really liked them, but I was actually a little bit skeptical before I met him. Before I met him, his other students were so enthusiastic about him that it kind of creeped me out. <laughs> Yeah, there was a little bit of a groupy vibe. There was something just a little too excited. It felt like a rock star. I don't know. So I, I'm of a somewhat cynical nature. And so I was like, all right, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I'm sure he's great, but really this great. And also you guys are weird, like settle down. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, okay. So I'm revealing a lot about myself right now. Okay. So I was skeptical, um, but I wanted to be polite because he was coming to our center. This is years ago. This is like 20 years ago. And he was coming to our center and I thought, well, I can't just not be at the class. I'm one of the nuns. He, this is his organization. I have to be there. I should just be polite and see what happens. But I really did have a grumble about the groupy vibe. And I was really a little put off by the amount of enthusiasm. <laughs> okay, so um, we went to meet him at the airport. And I was, you know, just kind of respectfully like this, just being polite. And he said hello to each person as he came um, from the airport through the gate. It was really sweet. And he put a kata over everyone. And I was feeling a little like this isn't really my jam. I don't, I don't know. This vibe is a bit much. And so I just kept my head down and was trying to be polite. And he got to me and he stopped and he went up and under like this. <laughs> and he went, hello. <laughs> and I cracked up. I really cracked up. And it, like all of my tension just kind of burst. Like I had all this tension and all this cynicism. And I was just like a grumpy pants. And he just cut right through it with hello. <laughs> um, and also, of course, the absurdity of this like very solemn figure, this grand Rinpoche just being so silly, of course, was perfect for my mind because I am silly. Um, and so he, he cracked my heart open a bit and I and I laughed and then everyone else around me laughed because I think they knew that I was like a grump that day and so they were all laughing at me I was laughing at myself we were all laughing it was great and that made me relax enough to listen and then when I listened to him live in person it struck a real chord I was really inspired some of what he said seemed very literal it seemed extreme it seemed different than the normal geshe teachings i was used to which are very linear very logic based lama zopa rimshe is not very linear um he has logic but he's not necessarily going to go 0 0.1 0 0.2 0 0.3 definition 0 0.4 0 0.5 0 0.6 definition that's not his style um, but what I found is that he inspired my mind to engage with practice more deeply, and he kind of helped me touch the magic. Yeah, the magic of Tantra, the magic of Buddhism, the, you know, the lift of the heart, 
um, he's so good at doing that because you can tell by looking at him, he really believes this and he really practices this. And as the result of that, he is the kindest person, but like so genuinely kind. I was walking with him back to his um, room once at a retreat in Australia and he would stop for all the ants and he would say, darling ants, and just wait <laughs> until they passed. And, then, and it, was, it was gorgeous. And I thought, man, if anyone saw us, they'd be like, these guys are nuts. But it's so, it so touched my heart with the beauty of his compassion. And then he pointed to a spider that was on the back of a statue and he said, oh, Yinten, that spider could be an arhat. And I was like, cool. <laughs> I don't really know what to do with that information, but that's very interesting, Roger. you know? <laughs> and then he pointed at this statue of a kangaroo that he was having built with mantras on them because he loves having animals with mantras painted on them. Don't ask me why, it's very cute. And he said, do you know, we have been kangaroos numberless times. Do you remember? <laughs> and I said, no, Ribeche, I don't remember. And he was like, hmm. and we kept walking, <laughs> you know? So there's a, there's sort of a playfulness and a randomness, but also an incredibly inspiring heart-centeredness that made me go, I do not know what this guy is about. There's something magic here and I can't put my finger on it, but I love to be with him. So he's very different to my other teachers. My other teachers are a lot more um, concrete, a lot more specific, a lot more logic and reasoning, and I need that. But I also need teachers like Rinpoche who are just magic and inspiration. And having the two kinds of teachers really keeps my heart warmed up, but also my intelligence functioning such that it is. Yeah. So that's one Rinpoche story. That's awesome. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so yes, teachers slowly, slowly, but not too slowly. Yeah, I think Venerable Amy would say that slowly, slowly, but not too slowly. Mm -hmm. Look for opportunities to meet great teachers, but don't jump into a relationship with them. Yeah, look for opportunities to meet them, to check them, to repeat teachings with them. Like don't just wait for it to happen at your Dharma center, request it, search for it, go to it. These are important priorities, death is coming. But when you meet them, don't feel obliged to make a relationship with them. You're checking, right? Just keep checking. It's like you're, you're interviewing them, they're interviewing you. Yeah, any other miscellaneous um, questions before we go into the mantra? Let's see, uh, guest user's iPad is unmuted. <laughs> Would you like to it ask told, It asked me to unmute. It said the host wants you to unmute. Oh, we must have just bumped it. Yeah, it just got bumped, sorry. Okay, so no other miscellaneous. Okay, so we'll go into the mantra a little bit. Um, in the mantra, uh, there's several mantras, first of all. In the mantra, we are, having the normal Tara mantra, Om Tare Tutare Turi Soha that you're used to. And then we're adding a few syllables which are specific to white Tara. Okay, so if we look at Om Tare Tutare Turi Soha, the Om keeps coming in, right? The Om is the, the enlightened body, speech, and mind. A -u -ma. Those three syllables coming together is Om. So enlightened body, speech, mind. Um, the, you know, the meaning of the word Om, of course, is used in Sanskrit and is used in Hinduism as well, and, you know, has sacred meaning in that context as well. But when we're doing Tibetan Buddhist, um, or I should say Buddhist in general, Tantra, Om has this meaning. Tare means quickly with boldness, because Tara, um, the green Tara, you know, with one foot out is ready to leap to the aid of sentient beings. But there's an association with swift wisdom mm -hmm. with Tara. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like this wind energy that when it's neurotic can be kind of anxious and fearful and a little unsettled. Mm -hmm. But when it's integrated, when it's developed, it becomes this really efficient, ready to leap to the aid of all sentient beings. And that kind of boldness, meaning like confidence, confidence, not pride. 
Tutare is referring to clearing away all fear, distress and sufferings of all beings. Ture is complete victory of truth over all negativity. Mm. And then Soha, all accomplishments. And Soha also means like, may it take root also by Kung similarly, but here, may all these accomplishments be achieved. Can I share a cute story about that? Yes, story. Very short story. My son had learned this mantra. I think he was six or seven. Mm -hmm. And um, I picked him up at Tara Redwood School over here. And he said, mommy, I finally went across the monkey bars today. And I said, really, how would you do it? I use Tara's mantra <laughs> to be brave and safe. Oh, Very that's so cute. cute. <laughs> that's so cute. But there's something to be said for that, right? The energetic quality of these mantras, it's, it's palpable. And if you're feeling a bit rough, just keep it rolling in the back of your mind. It really protects your mind. Yeah. Um, so then there's the add-on for White Tara specifically, these extras. So mama in this context means me. Mm. Ayu, life. Punye, merit. Jana, wisdom. And pushtim kuru, increase. So basically, may my life, merit, and wisdom increase. Mm -hmm. May my life, merit, and wisdom increase. So I'm guessing that's why whoever it was that was asking about the mama insert, can we change mama to the name of the person who's sick that we're praying for? Mm -hmm. It would make sense that you would insert with mama because normally this is referring to me. But I, I had a, um, a check-in with some of my other nuns and see if they could find the commentary. I left my commentary in New Zealand um, <laughs> and we couldn't find um, that exact advice to replace um, mama with the name of the person who's ill. Mm -hmm. So there might be a tradition for that, but I haven't found a source yet. So don't bank on it unless you find a source, but it would make sense logically that that's where it would go. Okay, so that's just the Tara mantra, all right? And the Tara mantra also helps protect from the eight fears, the eight fears related to samsara. And the eight fears related to samsara are related to your mind, right? Because samsara is your mind. <laughs> and so to kind of um, divorce it would be a wrong understanding. Um, the eight fears are what? Okay. So I'll use it together with the prayer of the eight to dispel the eight fear, to dispel the fears of the eight fears. Okay, so the first one is the lion. We have a fear of lions. Of course we have a fear of lions. Lions will eat you. What is the lion? Pride. Okay, we have fear because of pride. We fear losing the position pride elevates us to. Okay, so the prayer goes, dwelling in the mountains of wrong views of selfhood, puffed up with holding itself superior. It claws other beings with contempt. The lion of pride, please protect us from this danger. Yeah, so it, it's, uh, Tara's energy helps dispel that kind of fear that comes from pride, but I think it's a really interesting thing to sit with of what is the relationship between my everyday anxieties and my difficulties in communication and the fact that I have pride? Mm -hmm. Because pride isn't really discussed in Western culture very much because so often ambition is encouraged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And ambition towards enlightenment, proceed. Confidence that you have Buddha nature, continue. Pride that thinks you're better, cut it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yet, pride seems to protect us. Pride seems to protect us from people looking down on us, seems to protect us from criticism and disrespect. But really what pride does is it separates. It makes you too good. It's too good to be wrong. And so then you're afraid of being wrong and then you can't admit to being wrong because all of your identity is wrapped up in your rightness. If you just identified as a beginner, you'd be so much more relaxed, right? So much more relaxed if you're like, I'm new, why would I know? It's not a fault in intelligence. It's not a fault in ability. I just haven't learned it. Why would I know? Yeah, you're not, it doesn't hurt to say, I don't know if you identify as a beginner, but pride makes you afraid to say, I don't know. 
Because what does that mean about you? Thoughts? You with me? So pride is isolating. It's alienating. Yeah, Miguel. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I have this terrible, terrible problem <laughs> where uh, I've had to use pride. Uh, well, I thought I had to use pride because I was just a kid um, to kind of like protect myself from the, the judgment of others mm. uh, to prevent myself from myself believing in you know the judgments um and uh it's even like like it's happened in my like as a child and then also um as an adult in the workplace uh because i'm hispanic um i felt like people thought i was stupid or something um or uncivilized or a savage um and um yeah that's a I wish I, I wish I would have learned this kind of stuff sooner. Yeah, all of us, all of us. But it, it was like um, your dignity protected you. But then your dignity got tangled up with pride and arrogance and posturing and need to prove. And that's what caused the suffering. But dignity, you know, is that sort of protection of you have Buddha nature, your mind it can be perfected. Why would you ever have lack of confidence? Your mind is this perfect, pure thing that can be developed into enlightenment. You know, that is your nature. That is your birthright. And then anything you don't know, anything you're not good at, anything that's hard for you, that's just symptoms of ignorance and afflictions, which are removable mm -hmm. and are not you, but everyone has them. They just look different person to person. So pride feels like it's like giving you a shield to project, I am competent, I am worthy, you can't hurt me because I'm the boss. And it, it's, it's a shield that like, especially as you mentioned in childhood, it really feels necessary. And especially if you're a minority or especially if you're in a position where people want to scapegoat you for some reason, you do need to be strong but we're not taught how to be strong with confidence instead of strong with pride. We don't know how to be strong without needing to dominate, but there is a strength that has nothing to do with dominance or proving that's just really quietly confident and just rests in my mind is trainable. And the more effort I put into it, the clearer and wiser and kinder it will get. And there's nothing to be identified with in terms of my mistakes, in terms of my ignorance. So that quiet confidence, then it's like people can think whatever they want because you genuinely don't care. Yeah, you genuinely don't care because you genuinely don't believe them. The reason why it hurt before was part of you was worried they were right. Yeah, but confidence can be a complete beginner at things and a complete novice and really not know anything and in no way does that affect your feelings of self-worth mm -hmm. and it's it's such an empowering place to touch the difference between confidence not pride and so tantra is perfect because it's divine pride so divine pride is identifying with the buddha you will become rather than the afflictions that just kind of stuck to you which are removable, which are not you, but you will become a Buddha. You will, it's already happening. So you're identifying with your future self because that's far closer to your birthright, to your real nature than how you see yourself right now. So your divine pride says, I am Tara or I am Manjushri or I am whichever deity you have the empowerment for that you're connecting with. And that is actually more you than this meat suit. You know, and that's, it's kind of like, it's a trip, right? It's mental gymnastics, but there's a logic there. I think, yeah, uh, I think I'm, I think, sorry. Uh, I think I'm a little bit feminine because uh, I'm like really good at, I don't know, if, I'm not saying this is a feminine thing, but I'm really good at cleaning and I'm really good at cooking. Um, 
And my kids sometimes actually very often mistakenly call me mom. <laughs> mom, I mean dad, <laughs> like all the time. And, well, and maybe uh, part of it is that you've got a balance going on, you know, that you're not so afraid of the so-called feminine aspects of yourself. You've gotten more fearless, you've gotten more confident. And so you can be in the stereotypical masculine role when you feel like it. You can be in the stereotypical feminine role when you feel like it. And you've got some mental flexibility that comes from confidence. And, you know, you don't have to prove your manliness because you're kind of beyond that now. And that's, you know, thank goodness, right? May we all get there to not be trapped by our socialization. <laughs> yeah. Lucky kids. Lucky kids to have you. So the Lion of Pride is one of the fears that Tara dispels. And then we get the Elephant of Ignorance. <laughs> okay, so we're scared of elephants as we should be, even though they're adorable and smart. They can go on a rampage and crush everything. So too, ignorance, <laughs> okay? So the prayer goes untamed by the sharp hooks of mindfulness and introspective alertness, dulled by the matter maddening liquor of sensual pleasures. It enters wrong paths and shows its harmful tusks. The elephant of ignorance, please protect us from this danger. So because of ignorance, we branch into attachment and aversion because we have that fundamental ignorance that doesn't understand reality, that doesn't understand the reality of the self or the reality of others, then we cling to what seems to protect that self and we push away what seems to harm that self, but that very self we identified with was the one that was never there. It was the object of negation. There is a self, but not that one. Yeah, the self that is there is just that which is merely labeled on the body and mind or on the five aggregates. Anything more than that is an exaggeration. And that facade needs reinforcement constantly by the push and pull of attachment and aversion. And that push and pull is the very thing that's like the crazed elephant stomping all over things, just wreaking havoc. So Tara liberates us from this fear, the fear of ignorance. But what does ignorance say? It says you can't be happy unless you cling to what seems to help or push away what seems to harm. Yeah, it's scared that it can't be happy unless push and pull, push and pull. And you're, our whole day, we're like, this is too much, this is not enough. This is too much, this is not enough. All day, you know? And so if we can kind of get the crazed elephant to just settle down, yeah, just settle down and stand still. So much of that push and pull destructiveness settles even without any extra antidote. Just let it settle, yeah. So the elephant of ignorance is destroyed by Tara, but we are going to be the Tara that does that. So then we have fire, yeah. The third of the eight fears is fire. And that makes sense, of course, fire is destructive. The prayer goes, because this is fire of anger, the prayer goes, driven by the wind of inappropriate attention. Billowing swirls smoke clouds of misconduct. It has the power to burn down forests of goodness. The fire of anger, please protect us from this danger. So anger does a lot of things that are problematic, but one of the most problematic things that anger does is almost reverse purification. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So normally we're trying to purify our body, speech, and mind of past negative karma by using the four opponent powers or using the wisdom realizing emptiness. But what about our good karma? We have so much good karma. We've been kind, we've been compassionate, we've helped sentient beings. We have all these seeds in our mental continuum. And then when we're angry, it's like scorching the seeds so that they can't blossom into happiness. Yeah, it's like reverse purification. Anger kills your good karma. Yeah, and you know, there's a logic to that because what is the anger? It's the wish to harm. What is good karma built on the back of? 
beneficial actions to benefit sentient beings. So anger is completely opposite to your path. But remember that in Buddhism, anger means the wish to harm. It doesn't mean being upset, right? Upset can be many things, but when it turns into this wish to harm, to retaliate, to punish, that anger, that's anger in Buddhism, destroys your good karma. So we just kind of sit with, all right, there's a lot of reasons to not indulge or feed anger, but a lot of it is, it took us a lot of work to become as patient and kind as we are. Don't ruin all your good work. <laughs> yeah, you have a lot of good seeds in there. Don't take a blowtorch to them. Yeah. yeah, so Tara can help protect our mind from going that direction. So just like walking around, if you're feeling yourself get a bit triggered, a bit upregulated, anger is coming or anger is there and wants to grow, remember that anger is analytical and it will turn against you with too much analysis in the moment. Mm -hmm. Only analyze after, not during. Right. During, om tari tu tari tari soa, om tari tu tari tari soa, just protect your mind. Mm -hmm. And that is the meaning of the word mantra, mm -hmm. that which protects the mind. Yeah, so it really will be that circuit breaker you need to not let anger escalate and destroy your good karmic seeds. So then we get the snake, the snake of jealousy. Okay, so we're afraid of snakes as we should be um, lurking in its, right? Or I guess I lived in Australia too long. Not all snakes are dangerous, just the ones in Australia. Um, only rattlesnakes here, right? Um, lurking, okay, lurking in its dark pit of ignorance unable to bear the wealth and excellence of others. It swiftly injects them with its cruel poison. The snake of jealousy, please protect us from this danger. So jealousy is comparative, right? Compar uh, jealousy is always looking at what other people have and what other people are and what other people are doing. And it's annoyed. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't like when other people are wealthy, if we feel poor. It doesn't like when people have happiness in their workplace and purpose and meaning. It doesn't like when people we don't like are happy. Yeah, jealousy is annoyed at other people's abundance because there's an underlying thing of, well, but what about me? Yeah, why do they get this? Why do they have that? Aren't I a good person? Don't I deserve it? Look at them. They're terrible. How are, why are they rich? You know, Jeff Bezos, why are you so rich? You, you know, you're not nice to your workers. That doesn't seem right. Whatever, right? Like poor Jeff, right? He's always my whipping boy. Like I'm sure he's a nice person in real life, but I wish he would be nicer to his workers. Anyway, so you take someone who and obviously I'm jealous of Jeff, Be Jeff Bezos because if I was a billionaire, I could all do all sorts of Dharma centers and I would be so happy as a philanthropist, oh, right? So, you know, so our jealousy is really interesting because it sort of feels like people don't deserve what they have. And of course, the actions of a person in this life are conditions that ripen old karma. So at one point, many lifetimes ago, these billionaires were incredibly generous, incredibly kind to sentient beings, created the cause for so much abundance. And now in this life, they've met with conditions to bring about that abundance, but their attachment wasn't enough in check. And so then the pleasures of abundance, they just got swept up in. And so they're just burning through their positive karma, not creating much new. And the question is, if we had such abundance, is our bodhicitta strong enough that we wouldn't just get lost in pleasure? Yeah, would we pay it forward? We'd like to think that we would. We'd like to think that about ourselves. And maybe we would, yeah, maybe we would. But I think there's also something to be said for asking yourself what you do on your days off when you're really, relaxed, happy, everything's going well, does your mind immediately go to, how can I share this? How can I pay it forward? How can I benefit <laughs> sentient beings? Or do you just curl up in your Afghan and watch Netflix? <laughs> you know, 
a great way of looking at so it. So that's our abundance, right? Like that's good karma ripening to have resources and coziness and warmth and shelter and entertainment. That's our good karma ripening to give us all these comforts and pleasures. And do these comforts and pleasures make us think how wonderful it is to be happy. May I create more causes for happiness? May I share these conditions for happiness? Or do we just go, yay, <laughs> enjoy chocolate, chocolate, chocolate. Yeah. So, you know, we can, we can beat up poor Jeff Bezos, but really would we be any different? Check how you are on a day off. Now it's not to say you're not allowed to rest. Of course you need to rest. All of us need to rest. Our society needs to rest. Like we are crazy busy bodies. Being busy is not a virtue. Yes, busyness is not a virtue, <laughs> okay? Like serial killers are very busy. Yeah, they have a lot of planning to do. They got a lot of strategies to work out. Being busy is not a virtue in and of itself, okay? Yes, we need to rest. But when we're thinking about unpacking our jealousy, we have to really ask, what am I resenting? What am I feeling deprived of? And why do I think I'm as good or better than this person? What's that all about? Why am I not just happy when other people are happy? Why am I not just happy for them? So really working on jealousy, there are two main strategies. The one, first one is rejoicing in the happiness of others. The other is practicing contentment. And you practice contentment by asking, what is it I actually want to do with my life? Do I have the conditions to do it? If what you want to do with your life is work for the welfare of sentient beings through virtuous jobs, virtuous livelihood, you probably have everything you need to do that sort of work. Yeah. If you're retired or if your lifestyle is different, do you have enough physical and mental independence mm -hmm. to connect with the teachings you want to have? Probably. You got a computer in front of you. Yeah, there it is. You got the internet. So do you have enough to do what actually needs to be done? You do. Yeah. And so, you know, kind of having contentment doesn't mean complacent, but it means you're not so resentful with other people who are doing and being and having more, whatever more means. Because is there more leading them to enlightenment? And even if it is, great. That's one less person for me to worry about in my work for sentient beings. That one's fine. He's got, he's, you know, on the, on the right track. You can even be jealous of people with like a superior Dharma practice. Why? <laughs> They're one less one for us to worry about. Yeah. They're on top of it. Yeah. So jealousy is one of the fears. It makes us afraid of missing out. It makes us afraid of being less than, but, if we practice contentment, if we practice rejoicing, we can nip that in the bud and Tara helps us swiftly move through it and do comparison in the correct way, which is how to bring about happiness for all sentient beings, whether they're quote above us, equal to us or quote below us, even though, you know, ultimately there's no such thing really. So these are all sutra teachings, aren't they? These are really familiar concepts from sutra. This, you know, you're like, we're doing tantra though, right? But sutra and tantra are not contradictory, right? They, they merge into each other eventually. So this should be reassuring, right? These are your old friends, right? <laughs> Working through these afflictions. These are not new teachings. It's like, oh yeah, okay. So tantra is weaving in what you already know from sutra. And that is very good news because it's um, <laughs> less to learn, right? <laughs> So then thieves, okay. The thieves are wrong views. And thieves, yes. So the prayer goes, roaming in the fearful wild of inferior practice and the barren wastes of absolutism and nihilism. They sack the towns and hermitage of benefit and bliss. The thieves of wrong views, please protect us from this danger. So there are countless wrong views, but the worst ones, absolutism or eternalism and nihilism. Yeah, the two extremes. So we want the middle way. We want the middle way free of the two extremes. The quickest way to get yourself into the middle way thinking is to think of the king of reasons from Lama Tsongkhapa. 
all phenomena are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. So empty of inherent existence negates eternalism. Dependent arising negates nihilism. Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot, you could do a whole meditation session the rest of your life if you wanted to, just on that king of reasons. All phenomena are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. That keeps you out of the two extremes. Yeah. And, you know, more on that if that's new information to you. But if you're thinking, what is the middle way? The middle way is not falling off the cliff into thinking because everything is empty, that means it is nothing. Definitely. Yeah. And it keeps you from the, you know, extreme of like, grasping at permanence or thinking that things are inherently so that because it looks that way it is that way yeah and then the chain the chain of miserliness is another fear so binding embodied beings in the unbearable prison of cyclic existence with no freedom it locks them in cravings tight embrace the chain of miserliness please protect us from this danger. So miserliness is sort of, it feels like it's protecting your resources. It feels like it's saving. It feels like it's being cautious, but really there's this tightness that's so afraid to maybe even use what you have. Yeah, um, think about maybe your grandmother has a china cabinet full of nice dishes but then she never uses them, <laughs> you know, right? So they're just sitting there, you know, for decades, gathering dust, looking beautiful, but nobody uses them. Whether that's miserliness or not, I don't know. But the idea is, is that you, you do have, you have, but you're so tightly hoarding to it that you can't even enjoy it. Yeah. It's like you don't want to open the package and touch the thing because then it's going to ruin it. But then it's just sitting there on the shelf and you never enjoy it, whatever it is. Or you have things that you could share with people and it would help facilitate all sorts of fun in your life, but you don't want to use it because you don't want it to break. But then you never use it, so you never enjoy it. These sorts of things. Um, miserly with time, miserly with merit, miserly with a million things, but feel the way it's a chain. Yeah, so it's a, it's a kind of attachment, it's related to attachment, can be related to pride as well, but there's a hoarding quality that suffocates and squeezes. And Tara energy is freeing us from that kind of tightness. It's freeing up the resources again, letting you actually able to enjoy them. And then we got two more. Flood, yeah, flood of attachment. So sweeping us in the torrent of cyclic existence so hard to cross. We are conditioned by the propelling winds of karma. We are tossed in the waves of birth, aging, sickness, and death. The flood of attachment, please protect us from this danger. So this is very classic and we've talked about attachment a lot already today, but controlled by the propelling winds of karma, we could say the appearances of habit because we have associations with what we think is good, we chase forgetting that those are conditioned responses. You know, what we think we need for happiness is from our own conditioning. Someone else might see the same things and have no interest in them, but we think that they're needed, that they're necessary. Yeah. Um, and then the last one is the carnivorous demon of doubt. <laughs> carnivorous demon of doubt. So roaming in the space of darkest confusion tormenting those who strive for ultimate aims. It is viciously lethal to liberation. The carnivorous demon of doubt, protect us, please protect us from this danger. Okay, so doubt is allowed. <laughs> okay, doubt is allowed. Doubt can be really good. Doubt can be a gateway to wisdom. Buddhists love doubt, doubt's where we debate. What we're talking about is the carnivorous demon of doubt. What's the difference? The difference is nurturing it and feeding it 
and being ready to prove everything wrong out of a deep jadedness and cynicism. Yeah, can you feel it? Like the difference in your mind, picture being in a Dharma class, right? You're in a Dharma class now, but picture being in a Dharma class where you're ready to be disgruntled. Yeah, you're ready to be annoyed. You're ready for things to appear a certain way, either you're, you know, you might be, if you're Tibetan Buddhist, you might be ready for things to be too intellectual, too heady, too scholastic, and divorced from experience. You're annoyed with the galukpas, and so then whatever the teacher says reinforces that, your confirmation bias. Or you think, this is all kind of nonsense, smells and bells, religion is poison, what's this nonsense, where's the truth in it, and you're like ready for that to be proven with your confirmation bias, and so anything the teacher says reinforces that. Yeah, You're in a mood, basically, right? You're in a mood, you're ready for everything to be wrong, and you want to prove it wrong. Healthy doubt is got a really airy, spacious, maybe. Maybe yes, maybe no, let's play with it. Yeah. And if you've been around a valid teacher with valid teachings long enough, your doubt is tending towards the fact, right? You're assuming it's true, but you want more information. You're assuming it's true, but you're wanting more reinforcement, more experience, more details. So you're not forcing yourself to be convinced before you are. But you're assuming it's probably true what this teacher is saying, it's doubt tending towards the fact. Or it's equal doubt that's just kind of a happy, yeah, maybe, that's an interesting way to think. I can see the benefit of that. I understand where it's coming from. Yeah, maybe, yeah. And maybe is a lot more spacious. And you could have kind of a, mm, not sure, I got my doubts. But when it starts to get an edge to it, like a cynical edge to it. This is this carnivorous demon of doubt and we get stuck there, yeah? You can get kind of hardened and hard-hearted where you just, really it's coming from maybe some depression or some apathy or some loss of heart where you don't believe anything is ever possible and you're actually kind of sliding into some nihilism, mm. yeah? Like think of, I don't know, chapters of your life when you were a teenager and you were just like disillusioned. <laughs> yeah. And you were just in the mood for disillusionment. And it doesn't matter how inspiring anything was, you were just like, nah. <laughs> yeah, that. But we can bring that to the Dharma and then it delays progress and it can be such an obstacle. Yeah, so please have healthy doubt, please question things, but don't let it turn into cynicism and jadedness and let your heart be blocked. Yeah, because that is an obstacle. Yeah. It, it, what's coming up for me is like curiosity would be what you could apply to mm. that, that word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, curiosity, that's a good framing. Yeah. Yeah, curiosity like kids have, right? Yeah, and I think, um, wondering let yourself wonder and something my teacher always says to me is I don't know is not a correct reason to give up <laughs> I don't know is a reason to study more <laughs> which is so obvious right it's such common sense like your grandmother told you when you were five right like I don't know we know about I don't know it's not a reason to stop but still, even though we're adults, sometimes we come across a teaching and we're like, I, I don't know what this means. I don't know if I believe this. Therefore, I won't try. <laughs> right? And we just kind of chuck it out. And I don't know is not a correct reason. It's like once you understand something, then you decide whether or not to take it on board. You don't have to take it on board, but make sure you understand it first and then say yes or no. You feel the difference? Yeah, so now I'll just kind of shift gears and we'll look at a couple of the other mantras that are in the sadhana and then we'll take a break. Okay, so let me just pull that up. Okay, so in the sadhana, um, there's the circles, yeah, at the beginning. And maybe it's, I don't know, maybe we should look at the picture first. I don't know what's best, but this picture in the very center of the center of the center of the center is the syllable tam. Let's see, and we can, I don't know, I pass this back. 
it's not a great quality printing, but there you go. Okay, so the seed syllable is something that all deities have. It's a different syllable for each one, but it encompasses all of the energy of that deity. So for Tara, it's Tam. So here is the Tibetan letter Ta, and then this Ao makes kind of a aspiration, and then this little circle makes a M sound, right? So it's Tam, yeah or tum, like this. <laughs> and then you've got um, the crescent and the squiggly, which refer to other things, which is another conversation for another day, but this is the seed syllable. Okay, so then going out, we get that visualization. And it's tricky because the syllables for Tara, white Tara are white. And so it's a little hard to read, but you all have this picture in your Dropbox that um, was sent to you last night. So you can have a look at that. Um, so you get, Om up at the top. See the Om. Om. Okay. Then <laughs> zooming back out. Om. Ta re tu ta re tu re so. But you actually can go back a few steps and insert ma ma. See the ma's. Here you go. Ma ma. Arya. Ra. See all the way around. Punimjana Kushti Kuru Kuru, yes, Kuru. Kuru, and then jump to so. Yeah, so ha. And then you got in the pink, Om A A E E U U Riri, that one. Then in the green, the Om Kakakaganga, that one. And then here in the kind of purplish, pastel purplish, you've got Om Ye Dharma Hetu Pravawa. All right, so they go out like this, and you can kind of see the spokes that are referred to in the sadhana. And after the break, we'll do the sadhana again, and you'll go, oh, yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. But here are the spokes. And then here is uh, the concentric circles. And theoretically, this is all kind of at the heart. And then these colors are the concentric circles that are um, protecting you out and out. So basically, kind of put yourself here with the tum. Yeah, put yourself here at the center with the Tom. And whether you are Tara with the Tom at your heart, or Tara is in front of you and the Tom at her heart is enacting these things on your behalf, but you're like face to face close to each other, or she's at your crown, all of those are fine. You just pick, but you're all at the center and then out and out and out. Okay, so these rings here are the mantra, even though they're very um, hard to read because they're white. Now we'll look at what they mean, okay? Let's see. So many things to share screen. Sorry, give me a sec. Where did it go? Hmm. Sorry, I lost it. I had too many things open. There we go. <laughs> okay, now we'll look at them. Here we go. All right, so here they are in black, which makes them much easier to see, yes? <clears throat> and you guys have this on the handout. Yeah. Okay. So the first one is the tar the white Tara mantra, which is called the mantra for increase. What are you increasing? You're increasing power, merit, life, just like we talked about at the beginning of the session, plus all the things regular Tara does, like freeing you from the eight fears. Yeah, so this big long mantra is may I be freed from the eight fears swiftly. May there be action and protection, plus increase of life, merit, et cetera, specific to white Tara. So this is the increase mantra. And then we get the Sanskrit vowels. That's the om, a, a, i, i, u, u, ri, ri, li, li, i, a, o, ama, soha, that. That is Sanskrit vowels, and they're there to purify the body. So they're specific to the body. And then we have the Sanskrit consonants which are, and my pronunciation is dodgy, so just know that, okay? But the H's are indicating aspiration, a bit more air. So om, ka, ka, ga, ga, nga, za, 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 gya, nya, tra, 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 na, <laughs> ta, 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 da, na, pa, pa, ba, ma, ma, ya, ra, la, wa, sha, ka, sa, ha, kya, swa. 
or soha, but swa, a bit more aspiration in this case. So, okay, why are we doing Sanskrit consonants? Because they help purify speech. Yeah. So Sanskrit vowels purify the body, Sanskrit consonants purify speech. Lots of people do this in the morning as kind of their like warm up their voice for the day, um, but it also kind of gets them, I guess, purifying body, speech and mind to start the day. So it's actually in a lot of daily prayer booklets to do these um, as part of your morning ritual, um, just on their own. There's a little visualization that goes with them where they're on your tongue in little circles anyway fun fact but if they're looking familiar it might be because you come across them in one of those daily prayers okay so then under that is the heart mantra of dependent arising which purifies the mind om ye dharma hetu pavawa hetun tekan tatagato haivade Tekansayo, Niroda, Evamvadi, Maha Shramanaye Soha. Okay, so that's the heart mantra of dependent arising. It purifies the mind. And this one is more like technically speaking a mantra. The vowels and the consonants aren't like really so much a mantra as syllables of mantras. Basically, all of the mantras have those syllables. Now you've said all of them. Yay, tick. Okay, but the mantra of dependent arising is to remind you of dependent arising, right? So nice and handy. Why would that purify the mind? Because your mind is grasping at inherent existence all the time. So this just cuts right through it. Yeah. So those other mantras are included in the White Tara practice. And that is the story of the mantras. Would you like to ask anything about mantras? Yeah, go ahead. I have a question. So, um, what is the uh, is is it a translation for the dependent origination mantra? Oh, like like syllable by syllable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there there is one. Yeah, there is one. It's a bit. Um, I think there's one you can find in the Happy Monks publication. Happy Monks is a nice website that has a lot of free Dharma publications that are from good sources. I feel like there was one there. I could hunt for it in the break if you like, but um, it all boils down to that king of reasons that I mentioned, which is that all phenomena are empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. What do they dependently arise in dependence on? Causes and conditions, parts and whole and context, near imputation on a valid basis, the three levels or the three ways of looking at dependent arising if you're familiar with that teaching. So that's kind of the, yeah, in a nutshell, but um, the syllable by syllable translation does exist for sure. Um, so we could have a look at that if you're curious, but it's also Googleable. It's really popular mantra actually. So um, it's a good one for clearing obstacles as well. But basically, Mantra for increase, mantra, the you know vowels to purify body, consonants to purify speech, dependent arising to purify mind. That's the mantras that are used in this practice. All right, so um, we'll just do a short dedication and then have a little break. So one moment, please. Let me find a good dedication for you. <laughs> All right, so we think, may the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that is not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Okay. <laughs> 